Hi, this is Professor Fernandez, and in this lesson, we are going to talk about, in this video, talk about Module 2 of Lesson 8. The topic that we'll be dealing with in this video is Absolute Extrema. So I just want to show you um, a rendering of a graph that we are going to get to in the example in this video, and start there to just motivate some of these questions. Um, so here is a graph that I've plotted here. This is the f of x, y function, and you can see that this is a pretty... Um, curvy looking graph and it's got some uh, sharp edges at least the way we've constrained the the domain and what I've done to zoom in here is you can see that if I look at the function that I've plotted on this particular domain here on the left hand side then um, there's definitely a lowest z value and it actually occurs in two different places. You can see the blue dots there. One is at the origin, and the other one ends up being at the point 2, 2, 0. zero. Um, so on this domain, there is a lowest z value. And then if I zoom out, you can see up here, the red dot, there is a highest z value. And that ends up being at the point 3, 0, 9. So um, in the previous video, we talked a lot about um, local extrema and how we can uh, find that through a generalization of what you know from single variable calculus using critical points. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about how we find these uh, absolute extrema. So how do I actually know without looking at this graph that these three points are the, low, are the absolute extrema of this function, again, on this domain? Um, so that's kind of a quick motivation for that. And so let me start at the definition of what it means to be absolute, an absolute extrema. So uh, we are going to go back then to definition 8.1.1. So I'm just going to scroll up here in a minute and say that if the inequalities hold for all points in the domain of f, then f is an absolute maximum at a, b, or an absolute minimum at a, b. So I'm just going to scroll up here. This is from the previous video reminding you of what that definition was. It was a definition of local maxima. And just point out that in that video, we talked about how um, local maximum is when the y values, uh, the z values, f of x comma y, are less than or equal to f of ab when x, y is near ab. So there's no requirement that this happens away, far away from a comma b. What's different now for absolute extrema is that we have some domain around the point A comma B, some domain D in the XY plane. Uh, and then we are asking for the Z values, F of X comma Y, to be definitely less than or equal to F of AB on the entire domain. And of course, you know, the domain will be either given to you in the example or the problem you're trying to solve. Or if it's an application, we'll see that in the next video. Um, you'll be able to uh, extract the domain from the real world context. Okay, so scrolling back down here to where we were. Um, a summary of this definition then is that absolute maxima or absolute minima are the largest or the smallest respectively z values on whatever domain we are looking at. Okay. So question becomes, how do we find those? Um, again, like we did with, app, with a local extrema, we are going to generalize what we did in the single variable case. Here is a theorem that helps guide the way. So first of all, you know, before you want to find uh, these absolute extrema, you want to make sure they exist. You don't want to spend time looking for something that doesn't exist. So this is actually a really useful theorem. Um, what does it say? Let f be a, a continuous function on a closed and bounded set D. So that's one of the reasons I left this white space up here. I will have to tell you what a, it means to be a closed and bounded set. I'll do that shortly. Then f attains an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum value at some point or points in D. We saw this at the start of the video with the plot that I showed. There were two different points where that particular f of x, y had absolute minimum values and only one particular point where it had an absolute maximum value. Um, so let's get to explaining what's going on here. Um, so what is a closed and bounded set? So I'm going to draw some pictures here. Um, I'm just going to remind you that in single variable calculus, we also had a notion of an extreme value theorem. And basically it said much the same thing as down here, except this was replaced with a closed interval AB in R. 
So the extreme value theorem in single variable calculus said if I have a continuous function that is defined on a closed interval, meaning I include the endpoints, then it has a maximum for this function, it's here, and it has a minimum for this function, it's here. Again, it may have more than one maximum, more than one minimum, because they may be equal values uh, at different inputs. Um, so that was what extreme value theorem said in single variable calculus. In the multivariable context, um, the intervals are intervals of real numbers. In the multivariable context, we're now in three space. So we're dealing with sets of x and y. So those are our domains d, that we have some function f of x, y, that's defined over these domains. And we're trying to find the maxima and minima of, uh, and those are z values in this case. So the notion of a closed interval carries over to the notion of a closed set. And we end up needing a little bit more than closed in the case of um, multivariable context. We also want to talk about bounded. So let's talk about what a closed and bounded set is in R2, which is the context, uh, context that we will be spending our time in for this video and this lesson. Um, so I'm gonna draw a few pictures and then show by illustration what closed and bounded sets are in R2. Okay, so here is a set D and I'm gonna fill in everything inside the set D. So this is an example of a closed set. So what does that mean? So it includes, uh, includes the boundary, includes boundary plus interior points. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there are definitions for each of these concepts, boundary and interior. Um, but I'm not going to show you those definitions because our goal here is to talk about absolute extrema, not to get into set theory. Um, much more precise definitions of these notions are covered in advanced courses, such as real analysis or maybe in an advanced multivariable calculus class. Yes, such things do exist. Long story short, um, a boundary point is if you have a point where if you draw any disk around it, there are points inside the domain and points outside the domain. And an interior point is such that when you uh, look at that point and you draw uh, disk around it, then there is at least one disk that contains only points inside the domain. Again, these are rough notions. But uh, for all practical purposes, for us, a closed set is what I said here, a set that includes its boundary at, along with all of the points in the interior of its boundary. Um, so here is an example of an open set. So an open set would be a set just like the one I drew except that you exclude the boundary. Uh, so that's an open set. So, you know, think of, for example, the unit disk, x squared plus y squared um, less than one. If I plot that in the xy plane, well, you know, it might make sense to first plot the unit circle where x squared plus y squared equals one, and then to um, exclude the boundary because the x squared plus y squared sum is set to be less than one. So I don't ever actually reach the boundary, which is when x squared plus y squared equals one. So this set in R2 is an example of an open set, the set of points that are a distance at most, but not equal to one from the origin. That's an open set example. And then the last one that, you know, we're not really gonna be that concerned with is neither. So you could have all sorts of kooky sets uh, here's a set that starts off with a boundary and then excludes part of it and includes the interior. So that is neither open nor closed. Uh, it has some boundary, but other portions of the set do not have a boundary. Um, so analogs to the single variable case, so closed sets in R2, like we said, are analogous to closed intervals in the real line in single variable calculus. Um, open sets in R2 are analogous to open intervals, and then neither are analogous to like the half open or half closed, depending on how you think about it, intervals from single variable calculus. Great, so now we know what closed means. So the extreme value theorem is a theorem about this type of set, first of all, closed sets. Um, it's not a theorem about open sets. You might remember that um, 
if you have functions in single variable calculus, like f of x equals 1 over x, defined on the interval um, 0 to 1, uh, then they don't, or even, let's make it simpler, f of x equals x, defined on this interval, they don't, ne don't necessarily have a maximum or a minimum, right? This is y equals x, and it just goes on uh, linearly increasing um, in y values. So the y value would be at y equals 1 if x equals 1 were included, but it's not. So actually, this function on this interval has no maximum. Whatever y value you think is the largest, I can get a little closer, uh, a little higher than that y value by moving a little bit further to the right. Similarly, it has no minimum on this interval. So this is one of the reasons why you don't want to um, include intervals in R that are not closed and when you're looking for maxima or minima, although we'll talk later about a way to, um, to find those nonetheless using limits. Um, and so for R2, it makes sense, again, to look at the analog of a closed interval, which is a closed set. Um, bounded. Let's talk about bounded. So what does bounded mean? Long story short, bounded means contained in a disk of finite radius centered at the origin. Okay. So here's an example of a bounded set. I'm going to draw it. So here's my set D. Actually, this set is going to be bounded and closed, right? It includes the uh, boundary and the exterior points. So is this set bounded? Yes. Why? Because I'm going to draw a disk that includes, around the origin, that includes this set. And this disk has finite size. There we go. So it's a bounded set. <laughs> Again, you might think, why is bounded so important for the extreme value theorem? And here is an example. So what if I consider the set x squared plus y squared bigger than 1 uh, in, the, uh, in the plane? So again, we're going back to our unit circle. We're excluding the boundary. But in this case, instead of going back to what we did here, which is less than 1, producing a bounded set, these are literally the set of all points whose distance from the origin is less than 1. Uh, that's a set of finite size, if you will. Here we're doing bigger than one, right? So now it's everything out here. Um, and that set literally just goes on forever. Um, when you're trying to find the maximum of a function on a set, which is not a finite quote unquote size, you run into problems. So again, you saw this in calculus one when we talked about, for example, f of x equals x. We'll stick with the same example. Suppose the interval is now one to infinity. Right? This set is not finite in size, um, and therefore the maximum of this even very simple function on this set does not exist. So it's in all these ways that the extreme value theorem um, does what it can in terms of hypotheses to uh, give you a starting point of a set that is, gives you hope that there's going to be a maximum. Uh, and indeed, <clears throat> it is a theorem. So if the function is continuous, and you're looking at it on a closed and bounded set, then that's it. Those are all the hypotheses you need. You know from this theorem you have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. Um, so great. Now that we've talked about that, the question becomes how do we find those absolute extrema? So I'm going to go ahead to the next page. And as I've been sort of uh, uh, pressing in the videos for this lesson and um, in the previous lesson to an extent, we're just generalizing what we know from single variable calculus. Some things carry over, some things are new. The bounded part is new. The closed part is generalized from the closed interval. Um, the procedure for calculating the absolute extrema um, on a closed bounded set carry over from single variable calculus. So what do we do? This will sound familiar. First of all, we find the critical points that lie inside of D. So again, this is a reason, and you'll see this in a minute, to draw your domain before you start trying to find the absolute extrema. And then we evaluate the function at those interior critical points. So we want to find the z values. Later, we go back then, and we look at the boundary of the set. Um, and we find the absolute extrema of f along the boundary. The boundary of a set in two dimensions, right? Uh, going back to drawing this little our little representative set here. The boundary of a set in two dimensions is a two-dimensional curve. So it's a set of points x, y. 
Um, and this means that there's some relationship usually between x and y. Maybe y might be a function of x. Or maybe they're just some straight lines or something. Uh, long story short, this might seem like it's going to be difficult, but actually this is the part which reduces the step, which reduces down to single variable uh, optimization. So that that is a nice um, tie-in. And then last one, we now have uh, extrema along the boundary, or, or potential extrema. We have z values along the boundary. We have z values in the interior. So we just compare them. And the largest is the absolute max. The smallest is the absolute min. Um, I'm assuming here that, you know, because we're finding critical points um, and, you know, certainly assuming this is a continuous function, that we can do all of this, right? So uh, this is a procedure that assumes it's a continuous function, assumes that we can take partial derivatives and we can actually execute all these steps. Uh, so let me go off then and do this example. This is the same function that I had plotted in that applet. So we are going to actually mathematically find those two blue points, the absolute minima and the one red point, absolute uh, maximum. So I am going to get rid of all of this uh, stuff up here so I can go step by step with the procedure. So number one, we are going to calculate the critical points of f that lie inside the domain d. So I need the partial derivatives. So I take the partial derivatives here. I get 2x minus 2y. And then I get uh, the other partial derivative. I get minus 2x. Oops, minus, move this around. Um, minus 2x plus 2. Great, so those are my partial derivatives. And now I want to calculate the um, critical points. So I set these equal to 0. The first one gives me x equals y. The second one gives me x equals 1. And at this point, in general, right, you'll have a system of equations to solve. It's not going to be clear before you start the problem what structure this system will have. They might be a, a set of equations that are, maybe you get a system of linear equations, and you have to do some back substitution or something, or elimination. Maybe you get a, a system like here, where uh, you can substitute one into the other right away. Um, it'll really depend on the particular problem you're trying to solve. So in this case, we do have the x value right away, so that's nice. And then we substitute it in there, we get the y value. So 1 comma 1 is the only critical point for this um, uh, example. Great, so then I'm going to follow my procedure. Uh, and just to mention, 1 comma 1 is indeed inside our domain. So I haven't mentioned the domain yet, but let's look at it now because we are thinking about whether this point lies inside the domain. So the domain, what is it? The set of points in the xy plane between 0 and 3 for x, between 0 and 2 for y. So I'm just going to draw that. Actually, I'm going to draw a little bigger here because step number 2 is, um, or step number 3 down here is going to use information about the domain. So uh, between 0 and 1, 2, 3 for x, and then between 0 and 1, 2 for y. So this is our domain. Okay. And it's less than or equal to, so the boundaries are included. So I'm actually going to put this here in a different color so we can see the domain. So it's this and everything on the inside. Okay. All right, so step number one is done. We found our critical point. In the inside, 1 comma 1 is there. So that is in the interior of the domain. Um, step number two, evaluate the function at the interior critical points you found. Okay, so f of 1 comma 1 equals 1 squared minus 2 plus 2 equals 1. All right, so I know a z value that I might be interested in could potentially be a maximum or a minimum. I don't know. We'll follow the rest of the procedure. Number three, calculate the absolute extrema of f along the boundary of d. So here's where we're going to take a look at our domain. And we're going to look at the boundary, the, the four black lines. This boundary happens to be comprised of four lines. That won't always be the case. So we've seen already a few minutes ago boundaries that could be circular, you know, could be squiggly lines, could be functions. That is another aspect that depends on the problem. For this problem, I have a boundary that's four, comprised of four lines. So I'm going to call this bottom boundary the set D1. I'll call this one on the right D2 and then just go counterclockwise here. D3, D4, 
And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to evaluate f, the function f of x, y, along each one of these boundary, boundary uh, uh, curves, quote unquote, their lines, and then find the absolute maxima and minima along each of these. So d1, let's look at the boundary d1. d1 is defined by the boundary y equals 0. So if I go back to my function f of x, y, and I put in y equals 0, that goes away, that goes away, I get f of x equals x squared. So understand what's happening here. What we're saying is that if I look on this boundary, d1, which is defined by y equals 0, right? uh, these are my usual x and y um, dimensions. If I look on this boundary defined by y equals 0, then the function reduces to a single variable function, like we said before. And it's really simple. It's just f of x equals x squared. At this point, you are back to single variable calculus. You're asking, um, I'm looking at x squared, and the smallest x value here is 0, and the largest x value here is 3. So what is, this, you know, what is the absolute maximum on this interval? What is the absolute minimum? Um, again, we're on a closed interval, continuous function. The extreme value theorem from single variable calculus then carries over, which is just what we had talked about earlier. So we could, so we know that a maximum exists on this interval. We know a minimum exists. Various ways we could find it. We could use the procedure from single variable calculus, find the critical points, you know, everything we just talked about, but for the single variable case. However, this is uh, y equals x squared, and it's defined between 0 and 3. So we know that the maximum occurs at 3, and that value is 9, and the minimum occurs at 0, and that value is 0. Um, so we're going to say max at um, x equals 3 of 9, and min at x equals 0 of 0. Right? And we'll call it a day for the portion of the boundary d1, because we still got three others to do. OK, so now we're going to go to d2. How is d2 defined? Well, it is the line x equals 3. So I'm going to go back to my function up here and just substitute in x equals 3. So you see I'm going to get here uh, 9 minus 6y uh, plus 2y. So I get 9 minus 4y. So that's my function of y, 9 minus 4y. And the y values here, when I look at my boundary d2, they go as high as 2, they go as low as 0. So that's my domain for this function. Okay. Um, again, similar thing for all of these. You could apply the procedure from Calc 1 to find the absolute maximum of these functions. Or in some special cases like these, you could use a graph or some other technique. Um, this is a linear function that has a negative slope. So... Uh, its y-intercept is going to be its highest value, and its um, uh, you know uh, value uh, for largest y is going to be its its because y is the independent variable is going to be its lowest output. So I plot this function here, and you know at y equals zero, I'm at nine, and then at y equals two, uh, nine minus eight is one, so I'm down here, and that's y equals two. So that's my line. So we see that the maximum uh, of this function, it has a maximum at um, y equals 0 of uh, 9. And it has a minimum um, at y equals 2 of 1. Okay, so we now have lots of information. We need to do two more segments in the domain. And I've run out of space. So I'm going to uh, erase some things over here, make some more space for myself, and consider the other parts of the domain. All right. So uh, I now go to D3, and I look at that one. And that one is defined by Y equals 2 in this case. So I go back to my function. I substitute my Y equals 2 in there, and I get a function of X. I'll speed things up a little bit here. I get x squared minus 4x plus 4, which is also x minus 2 squared. That will help in a minute. And then I notice that x goes from 0, 3. 
So I'm going to put in my domain for this function right next to it from 0 to 3. This is again a parabola. Um, so I'm going to choose to find the maximum that way. It is a parabola shifted over by two units. So it's like that. And I only go up to x equals 3, where the function's value is 3 minus 2 squared. That's 1. Uh, and then I only go to x equals 0, where this function's value is um, negative 2 squared, which is 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So 0 to 4. Okay, So that's what my function looks like. Um, so we can see here uh, that we have a maximum, maximum at x equals 0 of 4, minimum at x equals 3 of 1. Okay, so um, let's see, uh, making sure, just checking with myself. Oh, that's not true, because the minimum is down here, right? This is the smallest value. So minimum at x equals 2 of 0. All right, great. And then d4, where are we going to fit d4? Let me, let me move some things around down here. Maybe I can move this and make some space. Okay. Uh, and then I'll move this graph around here, that way. Actually, I'll put it up here. We don't need it anymore. Okay, so then D4 is this line segment, uh, the last part of the do uh, boundary of the domain. This is when actually Y equals 0. Um, sorry, X equals 0. So it's the line X equals 0. And it's between Y equals 0 and 2. So between 0 and 2. And what is the function here? So if x equals 0, I go back and I write out the function. Um, this is going to be a function of y. Go back here, x equals 0, x equals 0, I just get 2y. That is a pretty simple function. It is a linear function that's sloping up. It starts at 0 and it ends at 4. So the maximum is here, the minimum is there. Um, so that was probably the quickest of the four. So max at uh, y equals 2 of 4, min at y equals uh, 0 of 0. Okay. Keep in mind that, you know, for some of these plots, I am plotting a function of x. For some of these plots, I'm plotting a function of y. So uh, keep that in mind when you're, when you're interpreting the horizontal axis and what it represents in these various plots. Okay, we are finally done with step number three. Um, we've calculated the absolute extrema along the boundary. And now, finally, all that's left to do is to look at the f of x, y values we've gotten and compare them. See which one is the maximum, see which one is the minimum. Oh, and I did notice one thing here, that uh, this should not be a four because um, we are multiplying y by two. So at x equals two, the, oh, yes, I guess it is a four max value of four. Um, so yes, that was fine. So now going back to step number four, um, comparing all of these z values. So let me just highlight the z values we have. Um, we had, er I had erased the value of the function at the critical points. So that was one. So now let's make this a pretty easy to see highlighter. So I got that one. Um, and then what else do I have? I have that one, that one. So I'm looking for all of the z values that I calculated. These are all values of the function itself. That one and that one. And there we go. They all fit on the screen. Great. So we are comparing them to see which one is the largest. So I'm going to circle the largest ones. Um, so the largest one we see is 9 here and here. Um, and then we are then looking for the smallest one, which we see is zero. Uh, and that happens at, um, uh, that happens at here, here, and here. Okay. So, and because I've kept the information about the X and Y values of these, right, then I can um, go back and find out what those points were. So first notice that the absolute maximum and minima do not occur at a critical point for this particular example. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, so they're occurring at some point along the boundary. Okay. 
So to figure out the x and y values for these, uh, let's start, for example, up here. So this is when y equals 2 and x was 2 and we got a value of 0. Okay, so I'm going to erase now this thing on the right-hand side because the critical point is not one of the absolute extrema and start cataloging here, writing down our actual absolute extrema. So, um, so we have absolute mins. So we got y equals 2, we got x equals 2, uh, and we got a value of 0. So that's f of 2, comma 2, 0. So that's one of them. Let's look for the next minimum. That's over here. We got uh, x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. So f of 0, 0 is 0. Okay. Uh, and then we have another one down here. So this is coming from y equals 0, x equals 0, z equals 0. We already got that one up there. So that's a duplicate. Uh, and that takes care of all the minima. And then we go back and look at the maxima. So we're looking at this one, the 9. That came from x equals 3, y equals 0, z equals 9. So absolute maxima. So uh, f of 3 comma 0 is 9. And then we go back down here. This is the last maximum. x equals 3, y equals 0, z equals 9. That's the same one that we already have. So our conclusion, finally, uh, after all this work, is that we have a repeat absolute minimum at 0, 0, and 2, 2 of a z value of 0. And we have uh, effectively a repeat maximum, but it's not at a different point. It just you know showed up twice in our calculation of... Uh, z value 9 at the point 3 comma 0. So if I go back then to the original uh, surface that I showed, which is the surface that we've been looking at on the domain we've been looking at, you see that that's why I plotted these three points. This is how we calculate these three points and actually know that they are absolute minima in these two cases and an absolute maximum in this case. Um, and again, those are the two blue points down there that you see uh, at the very, when the, when the function just touches the xy plane, uh, and then if you keep going all the way up, it actually goes pretty far up the z-axis. That's the red point, the um, absolute maximum on this interval. So uh, you can see already, just based on what's on the page, that these types of problems will take a lot of time. Uh, sometimes you may be able to save some time depending on the boundary. We had to look at four different boundary optimizations for this problem and even though even though they were all linear it was doing four additional optimization problems sometimes if the boundary can be described with one equation like let's say the boundary is a circle then you could use that information and then maybe let's say here we would solve for y for example or what i would probably do is i would just um yes i, I might solve for x squared substitute it in there and then solve for x put it in there and then look at, you know, x equals positive square root, x equals negative square root differently, and that might save some time. So depending on the boundary that you are looking at, um, you might be able to save time and not have to do, for example, four additional optimizations. That being said, you know, the rest of the procedure really is the same. So find your critical points, e evaluate the function at them, and then compare those values and this sometimes is referred to as a candidates test the largest value is your maximum the smallest value is your minimum and last thing i'll mention just to because it's important the assumption is that you're looking at a continuous function on a closed and bounded set if you are not we'll talk a little bit about that in the next video it's still possible to find absolute maxima and minima but we're just not guaranteed for them to exist by the extreme value theorem because that theorem requires that your domain be closed and bounded. Great, so I'll see you in the next video.